Science Magazine's more recent retrospective of this, published in their October 22, 2010 issue, stated, A year ago, researchers found the first water on the moon, frozen water buried in Cabeus Crater near the South Pole. And, Results from LCROSS, LRO, and other recent moon missions confound as well as illuminate. Radar probing from India's recently deceased Chandrayaan-1 orbiter picked up no reflections from LCROSS's Cabeus crater, consistent with sparse ice. But strong reflections from a couple of dozen craters around the lunar north pole suggest an icy bonanza. It looks as though Webb has again compared apples to oranges. The equatorial regions of the moon, as Webb put it, is constantly exposed to broad sunlight. As stated previously, the daylight temperatures on the moon are over 100 degrees Celsius, and a day on the moon lasts a month. And the vacuum of space would have lowered this water's boiling point below 26 degrees Celsius. To be exact, an atmospheric pressure of zero lowers the boiling point of water to about minus 7 degrees Celsius compared to 100 degrees Celsius at sea level pressure. There is no way water could survive under those conditions at the equatorial regions of the moon. But the polar regions are quite different. In the lunar shadow, the temperatures are dropped to minus 170 degrees Celsius. This is well below the boiling point of water in a vacuum. Couple this with the fact that some of the craters in the lunar poles are permanently shadowed and as such are permanently in minus 170 degrees Celsius temperatures. Water would no doubt be able to reside in these craters, as they are obviously spared of the violent conditions experienced at the lunar equator. Even the sunlit areas in the lunar poles are substantially cooler than the equatorial temperatures. In the poles, the hottest the surface can get in broad sunlight is only 300 Kelvin, or 26 degrees Celsius. And that's during the summer. The average sunlit polar surface generally ranges between minus 23 degrees Celsius to minus 100 degrees Celsius during the summers. And remember, you need minus 7 degrees Celsius to boil water in a vacuum. This means, even in sunlight, the vast majority of the lunar polar surface is cooled below the boiling point of water in a vacuum. The apples and oranges comparison is quite obvious. Saying that the equatorial moon rocks should contain water simply because the permanently shadowed lunar polar areas contain water is like saying you expect to find icebergs floating off the coast of Hawaii because we have icebergs floating off the coast of Antarctica. I have noticed that a lot of web subscribers also subscribe to YouTube user Thunderfoot, who spends his time debunking creationist videos. While the evolution versus creationism debate is a topic I choose not to get involved in, and although Thunderfoot evidently believes that the Apollo landings were real, it is interesting to note that he apparently agrees with us regarding lunar water, that any water found on the moon should only exist in the permanently shadowed craters in the poles. You see, the water that NASA found on the moon was in the only place where you can get water on the moon, in the frigid, permanently shadowed craters of the lunar poles. Everywhere else on the moon, water would be simply boiled off into space due to the solar flux and the low gravity of the moon. You gotta love a guy who sounds like Pierce Brosnan. Now granted, later in the Space.com article, we are told that Deep Impact detected water from all latitudes above 10 degrees north. But still, the polar signals were much, much stronger. Further, out of all six Apollo missions, only 15 and 17 supposedly landed at sites with latitudes above 10 degrees north. In which case, this deep impact data would only apply to those missions, not all six. Still, I find it odd that NASA waited until after the samples were confirmed to contain water to publish this data. And we know that there shouldn't be water at the equatorial regions, if for no other reason than the fact that it would have been boiled away in the vacuum of space. I think we can safely conclude that water found in the poles, which possibly got there via comet impacts, is no doubt plausible. 
but data suggesting water is found at the equatorial regions of the moon is most likely false. Here's a demonstration showing how water behaves in a vacuum. First, the experimenter puts a small amount of water in a conical flask. He seals it up and then proceeds to remove the air by using a hand-operated vacuum pump. When the pressure drops to a certain point, notice how the water starts to bubble vigorously. That's because it's boiling. Keep in mind, this is happening at only room temperature. On the equatorial regions of the moon, the temperature is far higher and the water would vaporize very easily. It could also be pointed out that the Cassini data has been presented misleadingly throughout the media. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this image floating around on the internet. The bottom center picture is labeled as water. That is a misleading label. The image in question was derived from this one, printed in a September 2009 science magazine paper written by the US Geological Survey's Roger Clark. It doesn't represent actual water per se, but rather the areas of the moon that Cassini's Visible and Infrared Spectrometer, or VIMS, scanned in the 3 micrometer wavelength to try and detect signs of absorbed water, i.e. water that was deposited on the surface and then absorbed into the rock before the remaining free water was vaporized. To detect water, the Cassini scanned the moon in the infrared at 3 micrometers and for detecting hydroxyl it used 2.8 micrometers. The image in the top right shows the locations of 3 average VIM spectra. How much water registers in this? Well, if I may quote direct from Clark's paper, Spectrum SP1 is dominated by Maria and shows no water absorption. Spectrum SP2 is dominated by the highlines and shows a weak absorption with a minimum near 2.8 micrometers, a characteristic of hydroxyl. Spectrum SP3 includes the south polar region and indicates both a broad absorption from the 2.8 to the 3.1 micrometers, a characteristic of trace absorbed water, as well as a stronger 2.8 micrometer absorption, characteristic of hydroxyl. Quite frankly, why does Webb even point to these unmanned probes as proof for the moon rocks? Didn't he already tell us that the trace water detected in the Apollo samples was not of lunar origin because the rocks contained no water-induced minerals and therefore got there through contamination? Now he tells us that this contamination-induced non-lunar in origin water was detected remotely by Cassini, Deep Impact and Chandrayaan-1. What, was all that water the result of contamination too? Even the commentary in Webb's sidebar is more convoluted than his narration. Webb writes, It has always been assumed that the trace water found in the moon rocks was the result of terrestrial contamination, due to the obvious lack of any hydrous minerals in the moon rocks. But finding water in these spherules has sparked a new life into the search for water elsewhere on the moon. Since Jarrah published Exhibit D, data from both the Chandrayaan-1 and Deep Impact spacecraft confirmed the earlier findings of the Cassini probe, which detected the same signature of water on the moon's surface as originally identified in the first Apollo moon rocks back in 1970. This finding destroys Jarrah's claim that NASA's moon rocks have water in them, therefore could not have come from the dry, lifeless moon. Okay, let me see if I have this straight. The water found in the Apollo samples was the result of contamination. This contamination-induced water was found on the moon, remotely. The detection of this water on the moon proves that the moon is... waterless? Confused? Yeah, so am I. It is also apparent that Webb is still trying to downplay the quantity of water found in the moon rocks. Webb states that the water detected by these unmanned probes is identical in proportions to the trace water found in the Apollo samples, which he falsely claims is as low as one hundredth of one percent by weight, or less than one hundred parts per million. The trace water detected in the lunar basalts when they first arrived on Earth amounts to less than one hundredth of a percent by weight, 
compared to two tenths to one percent by weight for their terrestrial cousins. Another big quantitative difference. After Jarrett published his Exhibit D series, this Space.com article was updated to reflect the findings from the Cassini, Chandrayaan-1, and Deep Impact spacecraft, which have remotely detected the same signature of water, or at least hydroxyl, on the lunar surface that was originally detected in the Apollo moon rocks. But the JPL article gives us a much higher number than what Webb claims. And not simply for the spherules. Roger Clark of the US Geological Survey was quoted to saying, We see both water and hydroxyl. While the abundances are not precisely known, as much as 1,000 water molecule parts per million could be in the lunar soil. To put that into perspective, if you harvested one ton of the top layer of the moon's surface, you could get as much as 32 ounces of water. If this water was found at the equatorial regions of the moon, it would certainly further call into question Hartman's explanation for the identical properties of moon rocks and earth rocks and the alleged lack of water in the moon rocks. Earlier, we learned from Clark that Cassini detected no absorbed water in the lunar maria, i.e. the regions where Apollos 11, 12 and 17 supposedly landed, and the lunar highlands i.e. where Apollo's 14 and 16 supposedly landed, only showed a weak hydroxyl absorption. How interesting that the Apollo 11 samples showed water to be around or exactly or greater than 1000 ppm, as we learned from Webb's favourite 1970 paper and others, and yet his oh-so-precious Cassini detected no absorbed water in the Lunar Maria regions, like, for example, the Sea of Tranquility. In fact, more recent studies on the Apollo samples have detected even higher levels of water. In the March 9th, 2010, Nature.com article, Old Rocks Drown Dry Moon Theory, Larry Taylor always said he'd eat his shorts if water was ever found on the moon. He never expected his own research to bring that pledge back to haunt him. The petrologist, based at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, was just 32 years old at the first Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in 1970, where his colleagues described their analyses of moon rocks collected the previous year, during the Apollo 11 mission. Taylor saw only pure metallic iron in the samples, a sign that there wasn't any water around to rust the iron. This and other results that year led to the party line, the moon is, and always was, bone dry. Forty years on, at the same annual conference near Houston, Texas, Taylor and his colleagues announced that they have been wrong all along. At the meeting last week, three groups presented evidence that certain crystals in the volcanic rocks collected by Apollo astronauts contain as much as several thousand parts per million of water. If we look up the definition of several, we find it is a number more than two. This means Taylor's study detected a water content of 3,000 parts per million or more in the Apollo rock samples. For clarification, we contacted Larry Taylor himself to ask which samples he found this water in, and he told us, We started with 14053, high aluminium basalt, but we have found up to 6,000 parts per million of water in some other Apollo 17 high titanium basalts. Definitely more than 2,000. We then asked Taylor which Apollo 17 samples he was talking about, but he instead named samples from other missions. I did a search on those numbers and came up with this paper presented by Greenwood and his company at the 41st Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in 2010. It's titled, Water in Apollo Rock Samples and the D to H Ratio of Lunar Appetite. In this paper, the deuterium to water ratio of the samples they studied are plotted in this simple chart. This chart was later reprinted in the Nature Geoscience article, albeit in black and white and without the dashed line dividing what they consider low amounts of water and high amounts of water. It's rather obvious from this chart that samples 10044, 14053 and 75055 contain around 600 to 1200 parts per million. 
whereas Apollo 12 sample 12039 has water as high as 610 parts per million. This is within the same range as the unspecified high titanium Apollo 11 samples that Taylor mentioned. What's really cool is that the higher end of this range exceeds that of the lunar poles, the best if not the only place where you'll find water on the moon.